a 50-year-old lesson. You know, and I thought about that afterwards, and I recognized that through different stages of our life, there are lessons that we couldn't necessarily hear at a certain season. You know, I, I, I started working uh, the sophomore, uh, the summer before my sophomore year in high school, and I didn't want to work. We had a local grocery store, and my mom thought it would be a good idea for her to go in and talk to the manager about me having a job there. Uh, and so she came home and said, I got you a job at the grocery store. I had planned on spending the summer at the pool. I had not planned on spending it working, and so I went to work. I didn't do it with the right attitude. And early on in the process, the owner of the store came up to me, and he says, you know what? This store has been in my family for three generations. These people are like family to me. And if you can't grow to see them the way I see them, this is probably not the right place for you. And for some reason, in that moment, I was in a place that I could hear that. And that shaped my work ethic for my entire life. Uh, th I think back to that, and, and Gloria will tell you, I credit that man uh, with good choices that I made. And I didn't make a lot of them in high school, but it, I credit him with good choices I made in terms of how I related to people and how I would work uh, for the rest of my life. Uh, but going back to high school, I just had a lot of regrets because I didn't have anybody who could speak into my life. Uh, I, I, I knew about God. I don't think there was ever a time in my life that I didn't believe that there was a God. Uh, but my church experience was, you know, going to, friend, going to church with a family or a friend, going to VBS with a neighbor, uh, and going to camp. Uh, pretty early, I started going to camp every summer. But I would come home, and there was just no church in my regular life and no voice speaking into that. But I remember, and, and Josh said this morning uh, in his sermon, he talked about, do you remember the time somebody scared the hell out of you uh, kind of stuff? And I, and I do. I remember being at a week of camp, and the missionary that week was talking about people being burned on a fire, a uh, funeral fire and stuff like that. And he talked about that being like heaven. It's like, whatever I got to do to get out of that, I'm up. You know, take me. I'm here. And so I made a decision uh, for my salvation, but I didn't make a decision for my life at that moment. And literally, I was 25 years old before God got my attention and I made a decision with my life. And so I don't have overly high expectations or delusions of anything happening, but I'm hoping that by the power of the Holy Spirit, which I think you heard about last week, uh, that some of you could be touched in that place that at the very least gets a hold right there and that sits there until an opportune time uh, for you to begin making choices with your life. And so you know, thinking about that Holy Spirit uh, that works in us, that is certainly an internal influence. Now, we know how much external influence we have. You know, I'm, I'm sure most of you heard that you're called the YouTube generation. Uh, for the, you know, your, many times your television is YouTube, you watch that, that's how you judge your life and stuff like that. Uh, and so there are lots of external influences. I mean, I, all I had to really worry about was peer pressure. Uh, I didn't have... The internet, we did have computers, just didn't have the internet, uh, you know, when I was a kid. But it was just that idea of living up the expectations of my friends and the people around me. You know, and, you know, I had friends who were athletes. I had friends who were on the dean's list kind of stuff. I was none of those things. I was one of those guys that just coasted right below all those people. You know, when you're we're four foot nine, your athletic careers are minimal. Uh, I didn't have any delusions that I was ever going to be uh, anything. I mean, I tried. You know, I was a running back, uh, you know, until after my sophomore year. But that, I mean, literally, uh, our fullback split my helmet in two with a head-to-head -head collision. And I thought, you know, my, my career's about done. Uh, I, I can't take too many of those and stuff like that. And so just figuring out what that looks like for you. Now, you've got the external influences. You know, obviously, we talked about, Jack, Zach talked about the Holy Spirit last week in terms of it, those internal influences. But recognizing what else is going on that affects you? You know, you have, a, you have an amazing thing inside of your cranium right here called a brain. Uh, but sometimes your brain works for you and sometimes it works against you. You know, there's a part of your brain that Scripture refers to as your heart uh, because it's where the, uh, the emotional, the reactional decisions are made. And then you have the rational part of your brain. And they don't always talk with one another. Uh, in fact, sometimes that part of your brain back there that has first dibs, on every decision you make, doesn't ask for advice. It just asks, acts based upon whatever stimulus it's getting externally at that point in time. And making that submissive to both the Holy Spirit 
and the rational part of your brain is the key to getting to that place where, at, in not just in high school, but your entire life, you can live that good life. Now, again, things can always happen. We don't control those. You know, circumstances and situations happen. You know, every week in our news, we come up with something that just reminds us we don't control certain things. But there are things that we do control, and it's the choices that we make. And so thinking about that, that idea of the, the good life uh, is, is so important. Now, also recognizing that for those of you that are freshmen in this room, to those of you who are seniors, to the adults that are in this space, our definitions of the good life are going to be significantly different uh, because of what life actually looks for us, like for us right now. Uh, what, the, what the choices are, what the temptations are, what the next journey looks like. You know, and, and for some of you, it's just getting you know, through your freshman year to your sophomore year. And, and sometimes it's getting through your senior year, at least getting through the first semester you know, of your senior year so you can go on to that coast semester you know, and getting ready for college or job or whatever else is ready for life. Or, or getting to seasons of life where you know, as adults you're thinking about marriage and kids, career, and stuff like that. Or, you know, you get to my place in life uh, and just beginning to think about what does it look like when I can get up every day and do whatever I want to do? Well, it kind of looks like my life right now, but I still do work for a living and stuff like that, so I have to make those choices. Before we can talk about the good, we have to acknowledge there is bad. You know, and in, in this, this last week, we were confronted once again with the bad in the world around us and things happening that we just don't understand. You know, I, I looked at the image of a, of a young man uh, in, the, in the, the newspaper reports, and I just looked at the, those eyes, and I looked at his face, and it's like, how does a young man get to the place that he makes the choice to take someone else's life? You know, what happened? You know, there, there's this saying that, you know, hurt people hurt people, broken people break people. Uh, but what happened to him? that got him there. Now, I, I, I don't think anybody in this room is ever going to get to that place, but we can all get to a place that we make bad choices that can affect us for the rest of our life. You know, it was happening when I was in high school, and it's happening today. And so what does it look like for us to make different choices and to look at the choices that are around us just a little bit differently? Now, do we have the, the slide for the scripture text for Galatians 5? So I know you've already seen this before. We're just kind of coming back to that. But the, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, for some reason, every time I read through this list, I want to skip over patience. Uh, I don't know why that is. My wife has a clue, maybe, why that is. Uh, but it's one of the things I struggle with the most. But when you look at that, recognizing that the way we understand those words may not be the way God intends us to understand them. You know, recognizing, you go, you go up, you see a tree, it's an apple tree, what do you expect to see on it? Good. I, I, you know, with the answers to some of the questions earlier tonight, I wasn't sure if I'd get the right answer. But yeah, you expect to see, you know, apples. What about on a pear tree? Pears. Yep, good. So on the tree of the Holy Spirit, you expect to see a Holy Spirit fruit. Now, we all know what those words are, whether we know who God is or not. We have an understanding in our mind's eye of what they mean, but we have to get to that place as understanding what they look like when the Spirit is in us and how they become redefined. And so just going back and looking at, at each of those words, you know, and just thinking in your own mind what those words mean to you. When you hear the word love, you know, most of us hear the word love and we think about something that happens to us or we want to happen to us. We want to be what? We want to be loved. We want to be loved. And, you know, and we've many times, not always, experienced some level of unconditional love from our parents. But we want somebody to love us just the way we are. Now, our first thought is not how we should love others. Our first thought is how we want to be loved. No, but, but, it, but it recognizing and acknowledging that, that love can be a two-way thing, and sometimes it is, at, it is at its best when we love the way we want to be loved. But when we think of that as an emotion, 
we lose a little bit of that. Because when we think about how Jesus loved us while we were yet sinners, He loved us while we were unlovable. And so it's not the idea of finding people in our life that are worthy of our love or that we're able to love because we, they look right and they talk right and they sound right and they dress right and they live in the right place or whatever. It's looking at people through the eyes of Christ and being able to love them because He loved us. You know, and there's simple little twists in the way we understand these words, but they're absolutely essential to whether we're going to be able to live that really good life. You know, that idea of, of living the good life. You know, these day and age, you, you talk to a lot of my friends, and it's like, how are you doing? It's like, living the dream. I don't have a clue what that means, but I'm living the dream. And I, I, I believe that in most cases, when somebody tells me that they're living the dream, they aren't. It's just their smart like way of saying, life's about as good as it gets. And I don't believe it has to be that way. You know, getting to that place where, where we really are living the good life, but we've redefined what good looks like. We understand it differently. And so looking at those words, you think about joy. Uh, and that joy too many times for us is confused with happiness. You know, good things happen, we feel good, and we might call that joy. Now, it's not even a word that we use a whole heck of a lot anymore, but we understand it many times in terms of those feelings we get when we're really feeling good about our life and our circumstances. But the Holy Spirit wants us to see that differently and to be able to have that internal sense of good feeling in spite of what's happening out there, in spite of what's going on. You know, we, in one of the questions earlier, we talked about this issue of, of teenage suicide and stuff like that. And, and when we can't see that there's good in us, no matter what else is going on on the outside, despair sometimes can set in. That's not where God wants us to be. God wants us to be in a place where we recognize that He loves us no matter what. And even though sometimes it may feel like no one else loves us, there are always people who do. There are always people who care. There are always people who will be willing to be there for you and to be around you. And being able to, to recognize and to live in that place of having joy or happiness in my life in spite of what's going on out here that I can't control. You know, yes, there are times I make decisions that stir up the things around me, but most of the time I can't control this world. I can't control how people look at me or talk to me or see me or even respond to me. But I can control how I respond to the people around me. And there's the word peace, you know, peace. You know, that was a big word when I was growing up, peace. You guys, everybody ever heard that before? You know, that, the, the peace movement was a big deal when I was a teenager. Uh, you guys thought you invented it, you didn't, we did, uh, kind of stuff. But this idea of peace isn't that idea of just being at peace with everyone. It's that, that place in our lives where I, I don't have to worry what's going out there, that I can have this sense of contentment in spite of any inner turmoil or external turmoil that's happening in the world around me. Now, and I, I identify with those of you that struggle with finding peace in your life. Now, I'm one of those personalities that I am wired for worst-case scenarios. Drives my wife nuts. But, you know, I, I can be in the best place and get into an argument or somebody, somewhere or get crossways with somebody, and that just takes my peace right off the table. You know, and many times it just requires some time alone with God to recognize, hey, you know what, that wasn't near as big a deal as I made it out to be. It just felt like it in that moment. You know, when I was a little kid, there was the story of Chicken Little. I right? heard the story of Chicken Little, the sky's falling. You know, I, I get that. Sometimes it just feels like the, the whole world is collapsing on us. But I have experienced enough life to know that time diminishes all of that anxiety. It's just in that moment, it feels like it will never end. But it will. And again, there are people around us that can help us. The Holy Spirit can help us with that. Patience. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm most of the time I'm pretty good patient unless I get behind the wheel of a car. And then it kind of goes out the window. Uh, because it, I, I just feel like because it's an issue that I'm working on, God just chooses to put every idiot on the road the same time I'm on the road. You know, and it challenges 
my patience. And, I, and I, I recognize now, it's like him saying, hey, take a breath, Mark. Put it in its proper place. You can't control them. They're probably not as stupid as you think they are. Okay? And even though you may not think so, you've probably made mistakes in your life as well when you were driving and people were calling you stupid and idiot and anything else like that. But so getting to that place where we can just rest in a moment in the in-between, between whatever now is and there is. You know, impatience is usually because we have impatience because we don't know how to rest in the place we are until we turn the corner, until whatever's next comes there. But there is a next. And what, if you stop and think for a minute, every one of you in the room has had an experience where a next has come. You know, and, and that thing that was so bad is no longer so bad anymore. Uh, but it's just being able to find that place where you can rest in those moments in between whatever is next. Kindness, you know, kindness isn't just about, you know, being nice to people. It isn't about people being nice to you. Kindness is, is about that thing of, of showing value to others. You know, people want to know they have value. You want to know you have value. The thing is, is everybody next to you, in front of you, and behind you also wants to know that they have value. And sometimes they need you to be the one to tell them that they have value, that their life matters, that they're important, that they're not alone, uh, that someone cares. Someone will be there for them in that moment. Goodness, uh, you know, being good, you're a good boy, you're a bad boy, you're a good girl, you're a bad girl. You know, it, it's not just about that, that scale, that tally sheet that, yep, man, I hope Jesus doesn't come back today because bad is outweighing the good. Or today would be a great day if Jesus wanted to come back because I've been really good today. You know, that's not the way the whole thing works. But this idea of goodness is getting to that place that I'm, I choose to be true to God in all ways, every day, to everyone. And I choose to be good. Not good behavior, but good to, to the people around us. You know, I don't to be good to the world. I need to be good to others. I need to demonstrate to them that goodness. Faithfulness, you know, again, faithfulness isn't just being there. On occasion, it's not showing up for the task you're assigned. It's not just, you know, doing the things that you're expected to do. It's, it's that idea of living the true path, that right path all the time, being there in the needs of every single moment. Everybody wants to have a friend who's there when they need them. The problem is in our world today, most of us are so selfish, we think that's a one-way one street. I just want people to be there for me. The reality is, in order for that to be true, I need to be there for them. I need to be the one who cares for them. Gentleness. You know, gentleness is not a word that typically we guys even like. You know, it sounds soft. It sounds weak. It sounds meek. But it's really that idea of treating things that are less sturdy than we are or more fragile than we are with that kind of gentleness that will keep them from fracturing. And people's hearts and people's lives and people's minds and, and, and people's psyche are all very fragile things. Every one of us has been hurt at some point in time. But just acknowledging and recognizing that it is a duty that I have in my walk with God to handle each and every one of you with gentleness. Because I recognize that in ways we're all fragile. We can all fracture. And I, want to, I don't want to be responsible for that. I want to be the one who holds those things gently in this world. And then finally, self-control. You know, it's not just doing bad or doing good. It's choosing right at all times. It's denying myself when it's not the right thing to do. When the opportunity is out there to do something that's either immediate or it sounds entertaining or it's what everybody else is doing, self-control is saying, you know what? Not me, not today, not now, no way. Not the way I choose to live my life. And so this idea of the good life requires us to, to understand differently what Galatians chapter 5 is telling us about what it looks like to be a spirit-filled person. And redefining those words, spending some time with them, wrestling with them, 
And hopefully we'll have a little bit of time yet even this evening maybe to talk in your groups about how that might look different in your life in order to live a genuinely good life. It doesn't just benefit you, but it benefits others around you. Thank you, guys. I appreciate being with you tonight. God bless.